I sell the proud swan's way starting at page 43. She found to attack them in a necessary tone, the worn inflection that pre-exists them and that dictated them, but the words do not indicate. With this inflection, she softened as she went along. Any crudeness in the tense of the verbs gave the imperfect and the past historic the sweetness that lies in goodness, the melancholy that lies in tenderness directed the sentences that ended towards the one that was about to begin, sometimes hurrying, sometimes slowing down the pace of syllables so as to bring them, though their quantities were different, into one uniform rhythm. She breathed into this very common prose a sort of continuous emotional life. My remorse was quieted I gave in to the sweetness of that night in which I had my mother close to me. I knew that such a night could not be repeated, that the greatest desire I had in the world to keep my mother in the room during those sad hours of darkness was too contrary to the necessities of life and the wishes of others for its fulfillment granted this night to be anything other than artificial and exceptional. Tomorrow my anxieties would reawaken and Mama would not stay here. But when my, anxiety, when my anxieties were soothed, I no longer understood them. And then tomorrow night was still far away. I told myself I would have time to think of what to do, even though that time could not bring me any access of power since these things did not depend on my will or seem more avoidable to me only because of the interval that still separated me from them. So it was that for a long time. When awakened at night, I remembered Combray again. I saw nothing of it but this sort of luminous panel cut out among indistinct shadows, like those panels which glow in, of a Bengal light or some electric projection will cut out and illuminate in a building whose other parts remain plunged in darkness. At the rather broad base, the parlor, the dining room, the opening of the dark path by which Monsieur Swan, the unconscious offer of my suffering, would arrive. The front hall where I heard, where I would head towards the first step of the staircase so painful to climb, that formed by itself the very narrow trunk of this irregular pyramid and at the top, my bedroom with a little hallway and its glass-paned door for Mama's entrance. In a word, always seen at the same hour, isolated from everything that might surround it, standing out alone against the darkness, the bare minimum of scenery, such as one sees prescribed at the beginning of old plays for performances in the provinces needed for the drama of my undressing, as the Combray had consisted only of two floors connected by a slender staircase, and as though it had always been seven o'clock there. The fact is, I could have answered anyone who asked me that Combray also included other things and existed at other times of day, but since what I recalled would have been supplied to me only by my voluntary memory, the memory's intelligence, and since the information it gives about the past preserves nothing of the past itself, I would never have had any desire to think about the rest of Combray. It was all really quite dead for me. Dead forever? Possibly. There's a great deal of chance in all this, and a second sort of chance event that of our own death often does not allow us to wait long for the favors of the first. I find the Celtic belief very reasonable that the souls of those we have lost are held captive in some inferior creature, in an animal, in a plant, in some inanimate object, effectively lost to us until the day which for, one, for many never comes, when we happen to pass close to the tree 
come into possession of the object that is their prison. Then they quiver, they call out to us, and as soon as we have recognized them, the spell is broken. Delivered by us, they have overcome death and they return to live with us. It is the same with our past. It is a waste of effort for us to try to summon it. All the exertions of our intelligence are useless. The past is hidden outside the realm of our intelligence and beyond its reach in some material object and the sensation that this material world would give us, which we do not suspect. It depends on chance whether we encounter this object before we die or do not encounter it at all. For many years already, everything about Cambrai that was not the theater and drama of my bedtime had ceased to exist for me. When one day in winter, as I returned home, my mother, seeing that I was cold, suggested, contrary to my habit, I have a little tea. I refused at first, and then I do not know why I changed my mind. She sent for one of those squat, plump cakes called petites medellines that look as though they have been molded in the grooves, grooved bow of a scallop shell. And soon, mechanically, oppressed by the gloomy day and the prospect of another sad day to follow, I carry to my lips a spoonful of the tea in which I have left a bit of madeleine. But at the very instant when the mouthful of tea mixed with cake crumbs touched my palate, I quivered, attentive to the extraordinary thing that was happening inside me. A delicious pleasure had invaded me, isolated me, without my having any notion as to its cause. It had immediately rendered the vicissitudes of life unimportant to me. Its disasters innocuous, its brevity, its brevity illusory. Acting in the same way that love acts by filling me with a precious essence, or rather this essence was not merely inside me, it was me. I had ceased to feel mediocre, contingent, mortal. Where could it have come from, this powerful joy? I sensed that it was connected to the taste of the tea and the cake, but that it went infinitely far beyond it. Could not be of the same nature. Where did it come from? What did it mean? How could I grasp it? I drink a, sink, a second mouthful in which I find nothing more than in the first. A third gives me little less than the second. It is time for me to stop. The virtue of the drink seems to be diminishing. Clearly the truth I am seeking is not in the drink, but in me. The drink has awoken it in me, but does not know this truth, and can do no more than repeat indefinitely with less and less force the same testimony which I do not know how to interpret, and which I want at least to be able to ask of it again and find again intact, available to me soon for decisive clarification. I put the cup down and turn to my mind. It is up to my mind to find the truth, but how? Such grave uncertainty. Whenever the mind feels overtaken by itself, when it the seeker is also the obscure country where it must seek, where all its baggage will be nothing to it. Seek. Not only that, create. It is face to face with something that does not yet exist and that only it can accomplish, then bring into its light. And I begin to ask myself again, what it could be, this unknown state which brought with it no logical proof, but only the evidence of its felicity, its reality, and in whose presence the other states of consciousness fade away. I want to try to make it reappear. I return in my thoughts to the moment when I took the first spoonful of tea. I find the same state again, without any new clarity. I ask my mind to make another effort to bring back once more the sensation that is slipping away, and so that nothing may interpret the thrust with which it will try to grasp it again. I clear away every obstacle, every foreign object. I protect my ears and my attention from the noises in the next room. 
but feeling my mind grow tired without succeeding, I now compel it to accept every distraction I was denying it, to think of something else, to recover its strength before a supreme attempt. Then a second time, I create an empty space before it, I confront it again with the still recent taste of that first mouthful, and I feel something quiver in me, shift, try to rise, something that I have, something that seems to have been unangered at great depth. I do not know what it is, but it, it comes up slowly. I feel the resistance and I hear the murmur of the distance traverse. Undoubtedly, what is pal palpitating mass deep inside me must be the image, the visual memory which is attached to the taste and is trying to follow it to me but it is struggling too far away, too confusedly. I can just barely perceive the neutral glimmer in which this elus elusive eddying of stir up, stirred up colors is blended, but I cannot distinguish the form, cannot ask it as one possible interpreter to translate for me the evidence of its contemporary, its inseparable companion, the taste. Ask it to tell me what particular circumstance is involved, what period of the past. Will it reach the surface of my consciousness, this memory, this old moment, which the attraction of an identical moment has come from so far to invite, to move, to rise up from the deepest part of me? I don't know. Now I no longer feel anything. It has stopped, gone back down perhaps. Who knows if it will ever rise up from its darkness again. Ten times I must begin again, lean down toward it, and each time the laziness that deters us from every difficult task, every work of importance, has counseled me to leave it, to drink my tea and think only of my worries of today, my desires for tomorrow, upon which I may ruminate effortlessly. And suddenly the memory appeared. That taste was the taste of the little pieces of madeleine, which on Sunday mornings at Combray, because that day I did not go out before it was time for mass. When I went to say good morning to her in her bedroom, my aunt Leonie would give me, after dipping it in her infusion of tea or lime blossom, the sight of the little Madeline had not reminded me of anything before I tasted it, perhaps because I often had seen them since without eating them on the shelf of the pastry shops, and their images had therefore left those days of Combray and attached it to others more recent. Perhaps because of the relocations abandoned so long outside my memory, nothing survived. Everything had come apart. The forms and the form, too, of the little shell made of cake, so fatly sensual with its, within its severe and pious pleading, had been destroyed or, still half asleep, had lost the force of expansion that would have allowed them to rejoin my consciousness. But when nothing subsists of an old past, after the death of people, after the destruction of things, alone, frailer but more enduring, more immaterial, more persistent, more faithful, smell and taste still remain for a long time, like souls remembering, waiting, hoping upon the ruins of all the rest, bearing without giving way on their almost impalpable droplet, the immense edifice of memory. As soon as I had recognized the taste of the piece of madeleine dipped in lime blossom tea that my aunt used to give me, though I did not yet know and had to put off much later discover discovering why this memory made me so happy. Immediately the old gray house on the street where her bedroom was came like a stage set to attach itself to the little wing opening into the garden that had been built for my parents behind it. The truncated section which was all I had seen before then and with the house of town, and with the house, the town, from morning to night, and in all weathers, the square where they sent me before lunch, the street where I went on errands, the path we took, if the weather was fine, 
and as in that game enjoyed by the Japanese, which they fill a porcelain bowl with water and steep in it little pieces of paper until then indistinct which. The moment they are immersed, stretch and twist, assume colors and distinctive shapes, become flowers, houses, human figures, firm and recognizable. So now all the flowers in our garden and in Monsieur Swan's park and the water lilies of the Vivonne and the good people of the village and their little dwellings and the church and all at Cambrai and its surroundings. All of this which is acquiring from form and solidarity merged towns and gardens alike from my cup of tea. That is the end of chapter one.